Welcome everyone to Payments Canada's 2024 Summit. My name is Michelle Bayo. I'm the CEO and founder of Finnovator, as well as the president of the Open Finance Network. I'm excited to be your host for today's virtual session. We have two incredible speakers, and we're going to dive deep on looking ahead into open data and the perspectives from the UK, as well as Australia, with our distinguished panelists and incredible friends that I've known for many of years. Uh, we have Jamie Leach, who is the open data strategist for Radium from Australia. Good morning. Good morning. We also have Simon Lyons, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for OB Connect from the UK. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Michelle. Lovely to see you again. Lovely to see you. I am so excited for this session because when I think of Canada and I realize that we have finally stepped over the white line and we're moving towards our first blush of open banking, but I also look at the world and I see all of the movement that is happening, moving from open banking to open finance to open data, and realizing that there's a McKinsey report that shares that there's actually up to 5% of GDP growth that could happen for any one country that takes the steps towards open data. I am excited for this panel because I'm excited for you guys to share what's happening within your own countries, what your perspectives are from around the world, and what can we learn from these markets as Canada takes our first steps towards open banking. But before we kick off, I'd love for each of you to introduce yourselves, share a little bit about your current role as well as your background so everyone gets to kind of grasp uh, the incredible work that you've done in touching open banking. I'm going to start with you, Jamie. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, as you so kindly said, I am the open data strategist at UK-based um, tech company Radium. I'm also the APAC regional director for Global Trade Association FData. Um, I am the founder of Open Data Australia. And as somebody that worked in banking for a number of years and then ran uh, tech startups and scale-ups before landing firmly in the world of open data, I have been part of the whole open data movement between open banking, uh, open energy, the consumer data right in a number of countries around the world since 2017. So um, I love to hear your enthusiasm for where Canada is going to go. And hopefully today we can give you a bit of a snapshot of where that could be. Thank you so much and so excited to dive deep. But let's give Simon the chance to share a little bit about himself. Well, Michelle, I think it's about five birthdays ago that I first met you as well. So I want to go backwards, if you don't mind, in my uh, description. If I, I'm a banker. Uh, I spent 20 years working at a UK bank called the Cooperative Bank, working in high volume, high, uh, high volume, low volume banking, which I always thought at that time, you know, if there's just a way we could get data to customers all the same way, really easy. If there's just a way that everybody didn't have to spend half a million dollars on the connectivity for it. And when that came along, that was called open banking. I worked in a small fintech and took them through the accreditation in the UK. And I was lucky enough to go and work for the open banking implementation entity. In those uh, nearly two years I worked there as well, I worked with the UK government to launch their open banking. This is something you know very much about. We spoke about that at great length. I then uh, worked for the equivalent of Payments Canada, which is Pay UK, uh, on a couple of open banking entities. And I finished up working now in a company called OB Connect. I got a great view of the open banking landscape in the seats that I took. And uh, I was lucky enough and chose well to go and join a company where we're a full service open banking provision. In my spare time for fun, I'm still an HMRC, which is the same as the uh, Tax Authority in Canada Advisor on Payments. I work with the Finance Lease Association, all the brokers in the UK uh, on an advisory panel. And it, it's probably a little bit sad of me to say it, but I enjoy every single minute of it. And being invited to a panel like this is pretty much the ice on the cake. It's a great privilege that anybody would want to hear what your opinions are. And thank you for having me. Well, I'm just honored to have both of you. Um, as you both know, you've been a part of my master class that has just come out this week. And, and I created this master class because this market is moving so quickly. And I think there's 10 elements of the future of finance that people need to understand because I think they're helping drive innovation and open data being one of the most important aspects of it all because it puts the control back into the consumer's hands as we move into this new data economy. So looking at our first question, we're, this economy is moving because it, like Simon said, it facilitates this seamless transaction of data for not just consumers, but also for small businesses. And it allows for these transactions to kind of create new opportunities. And I'm so interested because we've seen the first blush of open banking, but what does 
the opportunity for open data enable for all players within the ecosystem? I'm going to start with you, Simon. You know, I always try to give a simple answer, Michelle. I always want to get back to something that's, you know, a good soundbite, something people consume is easy because there's too many acronyms in what we talk about. The biggest benefit we get from these ecosystems, from open data, open finance, open energy, open whatever you want to put in front of the name is aggregation. We can use data sets from two different places to deliver the benefit for somebody. In the UK here, we power electricity monthly. Why do we pay it monthly? Because we're indoctrinated to tell us that we've got to take out a payment schedule, which is monthly. Whereas if we could share that data and we could share it even at the basic level between the energy companies and the bank, we could maybe have daily data. We could forward buy the same way the big corporates do to get the best benefit from it. But we've got to underpin a few things on the benefits. There's too many people just talk about the benefits. The power of standards and rules is something I believe in from the top of my head right down to my toes. They're so important to underpin these initiatives. And I think the really big thing that people like us should talk about sometimes in dark rooms, but maybe we don't talk about it all the way, is the security of the ecosystem. How do we bring the actors inside open initiatives together so they can operate safely, so we can ensure the integrity of the data is high, but much more importantly, so the ownership of the data is only given up to people who are allowed that ownership. So we get back to the benefit, which is aggregation. But for me, those aggregation benefits and what will be delivered by market won't be defined by me, you and Jamie. The market will tell us what benefits are. And if open banking's taught us one thing, what we thought it would do, it didn't do. And I look forward to be telling what other elements of open initiatives can do. Is that I better? Love that reply because it is about simplicity and that the data when given in clear in when when there is clear data, there is opportunity. And when it is safe and secure and the ownership is clear, uh, that's when we can truly find new innovation. And, and that's such a great way to put it, Simon. Um, and I, I'd love to hear, Jamie, because you were so involved in the creation of CDR uh, in Australia, maybe you could just describe what that is for everybody and then give the context on, on how you see um, open data helping the economy, considering Australia was the first to conceptualize this. Yeah, look, thanks very much, Michelle. Um, essentially, uh, Australia doesn't like to do what every other country has done. So when we said we were going to start with open banking, we thought, no, banking's not enough. We're, go we're going to try to take a much bigger, wide gamut. So we decided to open everything in theory by creating legislation called a consumer data right. Effectively, if you break that down, that was giving a right as in a legal um, ability to assign your data digital by the consumer consent. So a consumer data right was designed to literally be a fancy way of saying a consumer can choose what data they share with whom to receive a, an expected product or service. Now, as with all things that are introduced through legislation, there are very, um, there's a lot of detail and a lot of T's and C's. So we started with banking as a low-hanging fruit in Australia because it was obviously off the back of a Royal Commission into banking practices and the Productivity Commission saying we needed more competition and very, very similar to the UK. But we decided that year on year we would introduce, this was the original intent, new sectors or new types of data that could come in to further I guess, benefit the, the digital economy. So banking was going to be the first cab off the rank. Then we added energy data or open energy. The next one that was flagged was going to be telecommunications. That has since been put on pause. Um, then we're going to bring in different financial data sets, non-bank lending. There will be a number of others. Um, but the whole thing has slowed down a little bit of late. We'll probably come back and touch on that um, as, as we go further into the panel. But the question of what the benefits could be, and, and quite often we see different regions saying they'll introduce consumer data, but they stop short of the business or the small business data. Um, and I think there will be different use cases and different benefits that are experienced by the different demographic groups. But essentially to, to add to what Simon said, the ability to aggregate data, whether it is various data sets being cross-analyzed or even large pools of data that can be analyzed in real time using, obviously, computers. I'm not going to say the magic words of AI. Maybe it's ML, but we can analyze it and, and calculate things in real time. 
mean that we have a, a more informed, better outcome, whether it is a, a credit application, whether it's trying to work out if a product is fit for purpose, we can look at serviceability and affordability. I mean, we look at small business lending in Australia, as it is in a lot of countries, is quite challenging because traditionally banks want bricks and mortar as collateral. So for a small business to go and, and take out some sort of loan to get a premises or a vehicle or some sort of assets, they front the bank. The bank says, what bricks and mortar do you have? Because they don't tend to take cash flow into consideration. They don't tend to take other factors into consideration. The one thing we've started to see with open banking is the ability to pull all of your financial not just data, but behavioural assessment all in one location in real time. If we add to that, we've got a heightened, secure way of sharing that data. We, we often hear people talk about screen scraping and other unsafe practices of data being shared. So there are a lot of, I think, intended and unintended benefits that start to come out of a, a truly um, a well-designed and, and well-implemented open data ecosystem. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that um, that flow of the fact that Australia was looking at this, decided to go bigger to a mission of open data, um, has already checked mark open banking and open energy, and is, you know, telco might not have been the right path, but it looks mm -hmm. like open finance is, is what's on next. And I really appreciate that you brought small business to the forefront, um, largely because I, I think we all realize they're usually 98% of the GDP of any one country. So giving them any tools to simplify their lives or allow them to get uh, faster, easier access to lending, which means potential growth and innovation, more hiring. This is a topic I'm very passionate about. Uh, at the Open Finance Network, we're actually writing a white paper on why we believe open finance is so important for the SME market. Um, maybe you guys can share a little bit of thoughts um, why that sentence might be true, <laughs> both in the UK uh, and Australia. And I'll start with you, Simon. Really easy. They've been underserved for years. So if you look, we've had a big, I mean, this is a topic a little bit, something called the Structured Reform Program after 2009 financial. So we bundled all our retail customers in with small businesses in the bank so then we put all our big corporate customers into another bracket up top now if you are a huge corporation you can afford to pay for a million pound link to the bank to give you a really great through data i think the proof in the pudding of that would be uh, i use this example a lot in the uk there used to be bespoke links from every bank to every accountancy platform the three big ones are sage quickbooks and zero um you know they, they the antipode and nature of accountancy software is quite incredible and cashware software you're, you're very good at it um those links are now pretty much all removed and dilapidated. And the links that data is taken into a county software is all open banking. Now, what that's proven is, is that these guys just needed a standardized way of doing something, but there's a much bigger and much more important message underneath that. The hardest thing about running a small business is not running the business, it's the administrative side of it. And businesses fail because of cash. You know, the, the failure rate in the UK is the same today, I think, as it is in 1919 for the number of businesses that fail, and they all fail because of cash. If we can get bookkeeping quicker, and we can make that more efficient, and we can make cash flow more accurate, the absolute, complete, and utter number one rule of banking, and the number one rule of business is cash flow, we're making a fundamental material difference to what they can do. We're really giving them something there. So what we've got is an underserved population. Now, let's go a little bit further. In the UK, our own HMRC are going to open up APIs with tax data. So let's say that we can bring in what a recent return was for last year. But let's get a bit better than that. Why don't we look at a seasonal business that's making money, loads of money in January, February, March. Maybe they sell ski tickets on a ski slope. What a wonderful place to do it. There's not much skiing in July. But what we can do is, is we can see their last quarter showed this turnover. Now let's aggregate that in the lending information, the cash flow information. We've immediately augmented it. And then suddenly we need insurance in January, February, March, but we don't need it in April, May, June. What we've got the ability to do now is make accurate, real, material decisions based on true behaviours instead of doing what we've done in the past. Everybody in the same basket and say, well, we have to spread the cost of your loan over 12 months because that's all we're used to. Now, big ticket items don't do that, but if you're a my brother in law runs a building company, he's got 48 staff as well. Those guys stop a month in December and they lose a lot of work to weather as well. There's no 
you know, categorization for that. There isn't a principle for that that's with it. So your underlying benefit here is accuracy, but not accuracy in terms of the correct numbers, accuracy in terms of understanding sectors, understanding behaviors. We all work in banking and fintech. We all get up at six o'clock and get into the office and traditionally we'd leave at five o'clock. Lots of people get up at two o'clock in the morning. So they get cheaper parking. It sounds really dumb, doesn't it as well? But they do that because the car park isn't full. We just get a better understanding of people from any open initiative in my 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 opinion. And from that better understanding, we can better serve them. And I think that is the greatest outcome of all of this. So if we create better outcomes for our consumers and businesses, we're all going to win down the line. Your 5% GDP suddenly becomes real. Oh, I just, I love how you describe that. To me, it's it's custom, custom, right? Like actually yeah. taking the business that facilitates and giving them the solutions they need um, to solve their problem. And, and I, I truly do believe it's an underserved market. Uh, Jamie, share a little thoughts on what's happening in, in Australia. Yeah, look, I, um, I I sit here and I think we, we tend to think it's consumers are the only ones that need to be educated. You know, we, we talk about bridging the financial gap and, and raising, you know, financial acumen and businesses are no different. And, and we seem to think just because you're a business and you have the ability to hire an accountant, you think about how many small sole traders are out there or small businesses or people that have had a hobby or a passion turn into a business. They're not accountants by trade. They're trying to do the best they can. So you think about the ability to bring data in, not just open banking data, might be open finance data. There could be other types of data that can come in from um, point of sale or stock or inventory. Suddenly you start to have real-time data that can be put together into, you know, we talk about bookkeeper in a box. We talk about store management in a box. This is where you start to be able to create platforms or technologies where you can bring in all of these different data streams in real time, augmented by technology that starts to create real time reactions that breeds a healthier, bigger, growing, thriving business. Um, you think about it, if you're a, a high street retailer, you go, I'm trying to put my British spin on it. We just call it a, you know, <laughs> a Boys. main retail yeah. I don't know what they are in Canada but you know you're sitting there you know maybe you've you've got a, a a dress shop for instance Simon you're probably not hanging out in dress shops but bear with me you know your ability to manage your staff your utilities um the sales coming through the till how much stock you've got out the back the inventory the deliveries all of that in one single location and that banking and payments data is the cornerstone of that. The decisions that can be made, how many staff you need on next week, what deliveries you need. No longer do you have that manual drawn out process of, of chores that you may get to today, you may not get to it to three days time. It's right in front of you. And as far as what Simon said about bookkeeping and, and making quality financial decisions, um, the ability to automate things and look at that analytics, the trends, the behaviours, statistics, these are all things that we talk about, but they're all driven by data and it's quality, real-time data. Data, data, we say it both ways in Australia. But effectively, we're talking about the ability to have intelligence in your hand at the time you most need it. And this is what open data is all about, right, hand, right data, right hands, right time. That's when we can really start to, to drive businesses, but the economy overall. Yeah. Dare, dare I, can, I say, can I say something really contentious? And I'm going to apologize to the entire audience who are going to watch this. Don't do it for consumers. You benefit for small businesses. If we look at what happened in open banking in the UK, the initial adoption was small business for data sharing. The advent of lending where we're using new data sets to go and do it. It's been very difficult. A lot of the businesses that set out with consumer propositions, and I, I, forgive me, I don't know in Canada or in Australia, but banking is free here in the UK for a consumer. You can't improve free. It's pretty tough unless you start banking paying people. Is, banking is not free for consumers here in Australia. There are fees and charges for just about everything. But to your point, Simon, whilst I'm, I'm certainly not going to say don't, do it for consumers, I think the, the biggest 
impact you're going to see in the shortest amount of time is the empowerment of SME in particular. There's more than 2.6 million SMEs in Australia. And 5.9. Yeah, something like 80, 84 percent, don't quote me on that statistic of businesses in Australia falls into that SME category. So if you want to have the biggest benefit to the, the economy, it's got to be through that SME segment. I love it's how you a, both. Go it's ahead, discussion, a discussion on its own, Michelle, as to the thing is, is because consumer data will always be more challenging than business data. It, it just will by its very nature as well. So, you know, is there a dialogue there? Is there another session that says, actually, maybe what we should do is, is we should look at what we can do for businesses first and then extrapolate from that how we take down the bits that don't cause GDPR issues, data issues, information commissioner exposure, you know, th th there's a lot more there. And, and if you take the consumer search, and me personally, I'd go straight for financial inclusion because as somebody who's a, a massive advocate of um, the social side of banking, and I've, I've done a lot of it, I've got, I, I, I'm really still involved in it. I was on calls at this morning with the credit union movements in the UK. It's easier to do things in that sector where people are being abused by some financial players and they are paying six and seven and eight more times over than it is to look for, you know, a vanilla blend of somebody that lives in the suburbs with the four bedroom house and the 2.4 kids and cars. And so maybe there's another discussion there, but I don't mean to be contentious, but I generally seem to run off piece a little. No, I think it's really important because uh, what we're trying to do is bring to the forefront what's not being talked about. And I think mm -hmm. this is not being talked about, though, as we're doing this white paper, we're seeing the insight in Brazil and the UK and Australia that most of these countries, somewhere between 80 to 89% of all businesses are small to medium sized businesses, fueling something like 40 to 50% of GDP. And in that same concept, uh, if you could free them of 10 hours of added accounting work, uh, instead of having to screen scrape or upload download 15 different documents every month, uh, verify uh, information to ensure it's correct and give them streamlined information you could save them time and money and give their focus back to innovation, give their focus back to their genius, which is why they started the company in the first place and drive up GDP potentially in that same perspective. So I'm really happy we went very deep because in Canada, there is banking fees, uh, yeah. maybe similar to Australia. There, there's many banking fees, especially in business banking. Um, oh, in bus and sorry, in business there is. No, no. Retail. No, no, for consumers. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Michelle, I'll, I'll give you another thought. Um, the two greatest use cases that were, were touted when this was being designed in Australia for consumers, one was to be able to aggregate all of their data through uh, a personal finance management app, a PFM, which, um, yeah, I'm not going to say isn't a great idea, but probably not the most revolutionary use of data out there. I'm just trying to be careful that I don't offend anybody. Yeah. Um, and the other was to be able to port your mortgage. Now, I don't know about you. I, I have a mortgage. Simon, do you have a mortgage? I oh, shouldn't ask you this no, no. Yes. Yeah, it, it, It's surrounding me at the moment. <laughs> right. So we all, and Michelle, I'm, I'm assuming you've got, we've all got mortgages. Um. How many times a year do you contact various banks and see if you can get a cheaper, cheaper interest rate and move your mortgage? We're locked in for years here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe if you're really on top of it once, maybe twice a year, you'll, you'll get the urge to see if you can get a cheaper rate or if it is fixed, you could go years without ever looking at it. If you're a small business, you need to see your data, your, your banking data, every day you Absolutely. need to be looking at your your cash flow you need to be paying your bills you need to be doing your remittances you need to be you know doing your end of month um tax in australia through gst all sorts of things your sales tax everything else consumers can go months in between using it for anything even the most innovative uses but businesses need it every single day 
love that comment. I, I think it's just powerful to look at what's happened around the world with 50 countries moving towards open banking, being in an open banking environment already and moving to open finance. Uh, and because we're later to the game, um, there's so much we should be able to learn, I think, from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. so that's why I'm so excited for this session. And I, I think uh, another point I really wanted to bring to the forefront from both of your perspectives is how important was it to have a date uh, that the country was launching upon? Um, looking at the UK was January 20, uh, 20 sorry, 2017. And in Australia, in the midst of a pandemic, it was June 2020. How important was it? to align everyone from the ecosystem to get to that date. And, and maybe you could share a little bit, Jamie, on that experience. Yeah, yeah. look, I'll, I'll start this one. Um, because of the way that Australia went about introducing it, that date was massively significant. Um, in Australia, when we changed the law and we brought it in, we changed legislation, we introduced regulation, we created rules, we did all sorts of things, but every bank, 114 brands were mandated to comply by a certain date. Now they split that date into two. Um, the bigger banks had to go, the big four had to go first and then the rest of the market had additional time to ready themselves because they, they realised that the bigger banks had deeper pockets. They could afford to get themselves ready and, and they could afford to sustain any of the, uh, the curve balls that came out of it. So um, the big banks went first, then all of the other banks had to go. And that mandated timeline was critical to force the hand of the brands to actually comply. There was significant cost. Um, I think the last time I looked, it was over $3 billion that was actually funded by the banks themselves just to get to the point where they could comply and be able to share the specified data by the specified timeline. Um, and you can just imagine how unfair it would be if some of the banks got themselves ready by the time and others just didn't bother showing up to the party. So that line in the sand was critical, not only for the banks to comply with the data sharing, but it also gave the other side, the data recipients, um, clear insight into when that data would become available for their solutions to be able to be turned on. So in theory, the date was, was critical. And once it was published, now admittedly, Australia did push it back a couple of times. There was a lot of lobbying by the bank saying they wouldn't be ready. It was, it was too much to ask for. Um, but once the date is set, I think that is where you really see the significant work being put in. Um, and it's the only way that you can get the fintechs in particular and, and other organisations that are going to create commercial value propositions based on the flow of that data, that's when they can actually turn their solutions on. So in my mind, the date is crucial. Thank you so much, Jamie. That really gives clarity to how important the date was, especially that the date was actually June of 2020 in the midst of a pandemic and it still was achieved. Um, but thank you so much for the context. Simon, can you share a little bit what the date meant in the UK? Yeah, I'm going to go off paste again. I want to apologise. Jamie just said before, Australia rounded up 114 banks and told them all to build the same thing. In the UK, we had the CMA9, which were the, the mandated banks. They were legally mandated. So there's a couple of things to call out here. Number one, the date is really important, but you've got to have recourse. So if somebody doesn't achieve what you tell them to do, what are you going to do? Because if they've got no recourse, they won't do anything as well. I think there's also an element that Jamie had a crucial point there. I know the UK banks spent something in excess of, you know, three, four, five, six billion in total. And the reason they did that was because they all had to build their own software regime. So they all had to go and do immense heavy lifting on something they'd never done before. And I think that was a huge mistake. So the date is the outcome, right? Let's, let's be really clear. It's just an outcome. That's what date you need to do it. If I was sitting in Canada with a magic wand now, I would sit there and say that open banking Canada, whatever the legislator is going to, you know, it's going to own this, should own the software the banks can connect to so that their attachment to this regime is simply the ability to get data out and make sure that consent is given, i.e. do you have permission for it? And then a central body should own software so that those four bank, first banks achieve a minimum standard. And at that minimum standard, then you've got ubiquity and you've got the same access across the board. And that does something. 
It means you can control what your stage one and your stage two are going to be because your stage one's always wrong. It just is. You know, every, everything you make is that the first iPhone didn't have a camera. Um, you know, I must have said that a thousand times. But now all we're bothered about is how many pixels can I take a picture of my dinner for um, as well. So is the date important? It's absolutely crucial. Is the ability to mandate that date important? Even more crucial is the ability to punish or take recourse immensely powerful. But the thinking needs to be done now that we call it open because we expect 114 people or nine banks in the UK to build the same thing. Now, with the best will in the world, if you look nine people in nine different rooms with nine hammers and nails, they will all build something very slightly different from each other. There's an evolution here. And that evolution is, and I pose the question, I don't make it as a suggestion, is it time for open banking entities to actually provision software so that you can create the base level and control the standards so that all your banks can participate, all your fintechs can participate on a non-competitive basis? And then when you go above that and you've got your minimum standard achieved, they can augment that standard, but we own the baseline. So... I'm sorry if that was a bit off piste, but the proof of the pudding I come back to now is, is if you take a country where maybe I live and you look at the standard and by that the version of standards that the banks are at at the moment, you would not believe me. The variance is incredible by 10 versions. And we have a new version of standards coming out in the UK, version four in November, I think it is as well. And stuff. it's got ISO in it. It's got some really good stuff in it. Uh, legal, legal entity identifiers. It's got purpose codes. Unless we get everybody to the same standard and control it, the bare minimum standard, there's no point having those things in because it means we wait for them. So the date's crucial. The, I want to say stick, but I know it's the wrong word to use. The stick is really important as well. And the playbook is even more important, you know, how you do it. And as you say, Michelle, don't look at being late as being a disadvantage. Canada can cherry pick all those great things that everybody else got wrong. Being first is a privilege but it's also a curse. Um, the UK has done a fantastic job now, but you know you can learn so much and take from this as well. And there's examples of it all over the world. Jamie and I are talking this week about something we'll tell you about in a few months, which yeah. will absolutely be proof of what we're saying. Can I, yeah. can I just add on that? I absolutely agree with everything Simon said. Sorry, this is going to be a boring panel if we keep agreeing, <laughs> Simon. But um, look, um, two points I want to make about the Australian experience. One uh, the stick hasn't been, in to some people's viewpoint, quick enough to be used. There are always going to be times where quality of data, the the way that certain brands export their data, the, you know, there's going to be times where things just go wrong. But if yeah. the market is relying on a certain quality of data and that's not being enforced by regulators and that is their job to enforce it, there is a certain amount of eroding of trust and confidence in a system. So if you are going to bring in um, minimum expected quality, certain standards and things, you have to be prepared to enforce it. Enforce it in a reasonable way, but enforce it nonetheless. And if it means there's a remediation schedule that's issued with a certain timeline, you have to be prepared to enforce that timeline as well. So without going into any details, the stick is very important. The other thing is when you're designing standards, if I can give you a bit of advice from what was experienced in Australia, um, don't get a heap of the players in a room and say to them, what do you want? Do what you can. And if you can't do it, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you end up with things where you have certain brands saying, oh, well, we don't record, say, date of birth in our system. So we're not going to export that in the data. Or uh, banks that say we can't agree if it's a honeymoon rate, an introductory rate or a discount rate, so we're going to create a free text field in the middle of the APIs. Um, this is just some of my personal, you know, bugbears coming to fruition, but if you're going to do it, do it properly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it's bringing a lot uh, to the forefront of, what are these elements that make this uh, open banking ecosystem work? And it sounds like clean and clear data. It sounds like a standard API oh. infrastructure that everyone could get on board to. Cause uh, you know, data lakes, if you don't have structured data, 
very hard to facilitate um, the right actions if the data isn't in a way that is readable. Um, but what are what are the elements that that are truly needed to create a, a successful open data ecosystem? And Jamie, yeah, look, I'm just I'm going to come back to it is standards, it is security, it's consent. So you need to create those ecosystems that really reinforce the simplest way to, to build a trusted ecosystem that's based on security and consent. Now, whether that consents from a consumer or a business, it's the way that that, con that consent is shared, it's captured, it is uh, respected. So um, obviously, Radium builds you know, the world's leading trust frameworks for when it comes to sharing of data, um, payments, identity as well. So I'm, I'm, you know, obviously I'm a little bit biased there, but just in the principles of any data sharing, it has to be around security, standardization and, and trust. But um, Simon, your, your thoughts, because I know we've had these conversations plenty of times. What do you think? Well, the I think, you know, I after the last four months, Jamie, I've been on a real journey. Um, and what I've learned, the, the policymakers decide what open banking is going to look like. Okay, so, so and unfortunately, they don't do it. So they write a policy, but the policy is not worth the paper it's written on. It, it, it really isn't. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not a fan. I don't like it. I like action. So we got to look at the outcomes. But you know, the biggest lesson for me is open banking was free in the UK. I think that was an error, a big error. There should have been some way to monetize it right from the start. Because, as you say, free is retrograde. And the second thing is this. The banks spent billions, and all the banks get is kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked. And we could say energy, we could say insurance, we could say wealth management that place as well. And they had no incentive. There really wasn't a visibility of how this is going to be monetized as well. So make it easy for your people that have got the data. So if you can turn around and say, I, I don't know, let's take Wave as a, a big accountancy platform in, in Canada, I believe you. That, that's a... A pretty big one. So they're a really key player, and Royal Bank of Canada is a really, really key player. So make it really easy for Royal Bank of Canada to share the data and make it a low cost. This comes back to the software argument in the middle. And make it really, really easy that Wave have got a seat at the table to say, this is what our customers are telling us they need. Because in the UK, that didn't happen until later. It's very much consumer-led initiative. And, and, you know, that's what it came from. As I say, it's a learning curve as well. Because if they tell you what the benefits are, then the banks could be involved in a different way or the energy companies are as well. But the biggest learning for me, dead simple statement, make it easy for the people who've got the data to join this. Keep the cost down and you know and control the standards because if you control the standards, you can grow your ecosystem to anything you want. If you lose control of your standards, you will stop. The point about standards, I 110% agree with. And, and the concept about standards also then comes back to the consent, right? So we talk about fine-grained consent. We talk about data sharing being principle-based or standards-led. And at the end of the day, that's the important thing. If you build the regime properly with the end use in mind, in Australia, the government and the banks basically built it. It wasn't the fintechs. It wasn't the accounting companies. They didn't have a seat at the table. So I love Simon's thought about the end user being involved in in what the format actually is. Um, can I? I know we're almost out of time. Can I yeah. add one other thing, Michelle, if I may? Yeah. Um, we talked earlier about consumers versus businesses. There are a couple of examples of where consumer data can actually make a significant difference, and I just wanted to touch upon them. And I know Simon was talking about it earlier as well. So with finance, we talk about financial inclusion. Now, in Australia, you know, first world nation where, you know, we, we have access to education, everyone has access to banking, you know, to a certain extent. So the concept of financial inclusion probably isn't as forward, you know, uh, you know in everyone's attention as, as certain other regions of the world. But financial inclusion in giving people access to credit that haven't had it or the underbanked is still something that, that we benefit from here. But one of the, the oddest use cases that I've come across recently is around energy data. And this is something that I have fallen in love with, the concept of guardianship apps powered by different data sets. 
So there was one that came to my attention. Um, the ability for apps to ingest real-time energy data and to start to look at those trends and analysis. If you've got an elderly family member that lives on their own, for instance, you can start to see that they've turned their lights on at 6 p.m. every night. And suddenly three days go by where the lights haven't turned on or the air conditioner hasn't been turned on in a 40 degree plus day. The ability for that real time data to start to notify the next of kin. This is where we start to see data really making a difference in somebody's life. There are those use cases and we will start to see them move ahead and they are the types of things that can be commercialized. And I really applaud looking forward to where data can start to make a difference in in the average person's life but we've got a long road to go i think before we start to experience that in a widespread basis just to cheer you up um one of our biggest use cases from a business perspective is the top of a prepay meters for people who can't get you know we call it a direct debit in the uk where they can't get a regular payment schedule for energy and uh, i used to look after twenty nine thousand social a care bank account for in in the in the bank for the digital side of it. You learn more from what people don't do than you ever will from what they will do. So if somebody stops spending money in the bank account, you got a big problem. So are we looking at the data the wrong way? Yeah. You know, th these are the questions where we need the experts in the room. And and you know the most exciting thing is is I come back to my first point. Nobody in the government office knows what it'll be used for. And I'm not criticizing them. They have to start somewhere. But the most important thing about an API ecosystem an API driven ecosystem without a user experience is the market will tell you what it wants to do. None of us know. And what we've got to do is make sure that that data can be consumed as far and wide, as safely and as effectively as possible. And if you do that, you end up with open. If you don't do that, you end up with, I wanted a yellow one, not a green one. And and this is why this panel was so powerful because we, we went into deep dives on why this is so important for businesses, why this is so important for financial inclusion, even for the underserved, um, even if it's not just uh, the underbanked or the unbanked, this is the underserved perspective. To close us off, can you each share, what does open data mean to you? Why are you so passionate about it? Um, Jamie. Yeah, look, for me, Michelle, it's always been, I said it earlier, the right data in the right hands at the right time can change the world. And, and I think as an individual, my ability to consent for my data to go to that right hands at the right time to receive whatever product or service will better, um, better serve me, that's my right. And we have not seen that where we've got the ability for me to direct standardised data sharing to actually benefit from a product or service. So to me, that's what open data, that's the, the promise of what open data can achieve. We're a long way off, but at least the world is starting to move in that direction. Amazing, Simon. Most of the decisions we've made in our life since modern civilization began, if we look at electricity as giving us a point of what we've got have been made and constrained by time. Um, and if we look through the choices we've made about the motor vehicle or the car or the aeroplane or travel or about how we booked travel and when the internet came around, we could suddenly fulfill things very quickly. I believe that what we're doing here is giving our chance to make decisions closer to real time than we actually did. I remember back to the iPhone when it was launched, it was 10,000 songs on a phone. And very, very quickly, it was uh, a camera. And if you look at the things that that's replaced, we've allowed to get those things faster. I think the open data regimes allow us to change the indoctrinated patterns we have as humans in our countries of how we procure, how we make decisions and how we run our lives. And the final outcomes, uh, faster, stronger, better. Um, we started off with letters, pigeons, and then we went to telephones, and then we went to fax machines, and then we went to telexes, and then we got text messages, the advent of SMS. I can't think of a better path to show us where we go to, where we've now got WhatsApp, and we've now got Messenger. And I really look forward to being able to make a decision about my energy bill in absolute perfect correlation with my water bill with where I'm going to be in holiday next week to if I'm going to be away and I'm not going to be using as much of it and getting a better rate. That for me is great. Choice, speed, efficiency. It's wonderful. 
I love this panel for what it brought to the forefront. And I, I think it's showing the fact that open data is the future. And it's all about how each one country gets there uh, with the right guardrails, with the right mission, with consumers and SMEs at the forefront of this thought uh, to ensure that hopefully we drive up some GDP as we free up some time and dive towards innovation, lower costs, more inclusivity, better competition, and more custom custom, uh, which everyone seems to be very uh, accustomed to. Uh, so very uh, thankful to both of you uh, for staying up late uh, and joining us on this panel from Australia and the UK to share some insights with the, the Payments Canada 2024 Summit. So thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Michelle.